So then I'll keep my introduction also a bit uh, short. Um, so I work at IHG Delft Institute for Water Education, the largest uh, education facility in the world uh, specialized in uh, everything with water. And uh, there I teach uh, topics on GIS. And I also have my own company, uh, Quest GIS, to give support on open source GIS, um, individual trainings, online trainings. Um, what's uh, very interesting is uh, that I also have the GIS Open Courseware platform where you can find uh, a lot of free courses and I have my YouTube channel. You might want to uh, look there for more uh, related also to this presentation. But let's get started. So the nice thing about QGIS is that it's an integrator of uh, tools. It comes with core applications that we can use, but for hydrology uh, we mostly have to rely on uh, plugins. Uh, and a specific type of uh, plugin. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So there are the so-called processing provider plugins, and maybe you're not so aware of what that means. So there, these are different tools that are also standalone tools that you can use for your analysis uh, in Python or in their own uh, environment. Uh, you might see other talks uh, at this conference specifically about uh, these tools. Um, but because QGIS is a nice integrator, and they are processing provider plugins. They can add these uh, algorithms from third-party software to the processing toolbox, and it will in that way also be integrated in the QGIS uh, Python framework, and you can use the model builder to make your graphical models and have your workflows. You can do batch processing. It comes as uh, Python classes, and uh, if you develop these kind of plugins, you can also have uh, things added to the interface. That's not necessary, but you could do that. Until recently, some uh, of these processing provider plugins uh, have been packaged with QGIS, but this has uh, changed a bit in the past years. So maybe Python programmers know PEP. There's also CAP, QEP, the QGIS enhancement proposals. And there was one uh, in the past of uh, removing the third-party providers uh, from being packaged with QGIS. So we talk about Saga and uh, Grass. You're, you have been used to that that's packaged with QGIS. The problem with that was that the core developers who are already busy with a lot of other things related to the core of QGIS also had to maintain uh, the integration of these tools in QGIS. So now in recent versions, you will see that you have to install uh, these tools and uh, a processing provider plugin to uh, deal with it. And for hydrologists, uh, this caused a bit of a problem with Saga. Uh, the upslope area tool is not working anymore. You have to do uh, all kinds of workarounds, install all dependencies, or tweak some uh, files on your system. And for that's not what hydrologists are necessarily interested in to tweak files uh, related to software. So, um, well, here you see that it uh, finally happened uh, that these uh, non native processing providers were uh, removed. And uh, this saga issue has still not been uh, solved. And I, of course, for my work and also for courses, need to rely on uh, robust uh, tools. So um, therefore, because we had a, a level playing field, I uh, started to develop during COVID a PC Raster Tools plugin, which relies on a, also a very old GIS like, uh, uh, like Grass. Um, and it's also open source, and it comes with specific Python modules for uh, hydrological and environmental uh, modeling. It's um, Real power is uh, dynamic modeling, so in space and in time, uh, st stochastic modeling and data assimilation. But for QGIS, um, I had the idea to add those 100 raster processing tools to the processing toolbox, and then also have the possibility when people can hook their hydrological models that they developed in the PC raster framework also to QGIS. So this was uh, um, developed prototype during uh, COVID, and then uh, with Niall Dawson, um, we uh, finalized it as an official plugin, which was launched in 2021. And uh, now it's used a lot uh, in, uh, in my classes and in, uh, in the book QGIS for hydrological applications. Uh, the second edition has that. The first edition is still with Saga. And uh, I, I wrote that book together with uh, Kurt Menke, who is also here. And uh, we, we teach that also together in our classes. And thanks to Jürgen Fischer, it was included in the OSGO4W installer. Um, so people can easily install it, like they can also install uh, the missing grass or uh, Saga packages because they're now third-party uh, tools. And uh, on all operating systems, it works uh, great in the Conda environment. And uh, this morning, I heard that also grass will uh, have a Conda installer. So you will have everything nicely in QGIS if you uh, install it in uh, a Conda environment. 
So this is then how it looks like in your processing toolbox. Um, there are all kinds of operations, but for hydrology, these uh, hydrological and material transport operations are very useful. And the names of all these tools are exactly similar as their Python uh, function that you can use in the PC Raster Python framework. So also didactically, when people get used to making their models, graphical models, or using the tools in QGIS, they can easily step to uh, Python programming if they need to. But back to what hydrologists often need to do is stream and catchment delineation. And independent of the software, there are certain steps you need to follow. And um, of course, you need a digital elevation model. Um, you need to put tiles together. You need to uh, fill the sinks and remove spikes, calculate the flow direction, and derive the streams, define your outlet on the derived stream because you're making a model. And then finally, you can derive the catchment. And uh, I'm going to guide you a bit through uh, the choices that you have in QGIS for doing all this. First of all, to get your digital elevation models, of course, you have probably nice national data sets, but if you don't have that, you're relying on global open data sets. And there are two very nice plugins. There is the Open Topography DEM Downloader plugin, um, which uh, if you have an account, you can make a, a, get an API key and you can use this plugin. And as you see on the screen, it will give access to eight different global DEMs that are available. And the nice thing is it will download it just for your uh, uh, area of choice, so the map canvas, and you don't need to stitch uh, the tiles together. Um, another plugin is the SRTM Downloader plugin, which downloads the SRTM uh, One Arc Second product, and it downloads all the tiles. And in a recent release, it creates a virtual raster that mosaics these tiles already for you together, and you can use in your further processing. So mosaicing often is uh, skipped because the tools already do that for you. But if you need to do it, you have two uh, choices. From uh, QGIS Core, you can uh, either use Merge, that will create a new data set, which is quite large, uh, just a stitched uh, uh, GeoTIFF, probably. Or you can make a virtual raster, which uh, doesn't duplicate the data, but defines virtually that the tiles belong together. If you have uh, DEMs from different sources with different cell sizes, I can recommend to look at the resample tool from uh, uh, the PC Raster Tools plugin, uh, which will fit everything to a mask raster and resample it to uh, that resolution. And you can add as many rasters as you want. It will fill in uh, the no data that is left over within the mask with the next raster that is in your list. That's basically how it works. There's a problem with these uh, DEMs that you uh, download uh, from the internet because they often use the geographic coordinate system and that is not useful for hydrological applications um, because uh, they need to be projected to a coordinate reference system. It has to do with this problem. Maybe you know from mathematics when you calculate a slope, let's say of this point, you uh, draw a tangent line and you do uh, dz over dx with the arc tangent, you can get then the degrees. The problem is if you have the, uh, glow, uh, the geographic coordinate system is that your x units and your y units are in degrees, latitude, longitude, and the z units are in the meters uh, of elevation, and that uh, most of these algorithms will still run and will produce beautiful maps with nice colors, but completely wrong. So you should always uh, reproject your DEM to um, uh, a coordinate reference system to avoid this. But of course, a raster is not uh, a line. So what it does, maybe you have never realized, if you calculate the slope or the flow direction, it will do that in a moving window of three by three pixels. And it will assign the steepest slope to the center pixel that it encounters. And as a consequence, you will lose uh, the boundary because there's no data. And that's what all slope algorithms do if you apply it to a raster. Once you've uh, downloaded, if you started with tiles, then uh, often your um, study area is not nicely in the middle of a tile, but uh, scattered over several tiles, and you, then you need to uh, clip it. In raster terminology, we call that subset. And uh, you really need to do that because one of the next steps is quite calculation uh, intensive. So don't keep it at the very large uh, DM that you might have downloaded, but clip it really to what you as an expert see as the boundaries of your study area. If you make it too small, then you will get uh, a bit of squared catchments out of it because it stops at the boundary. Uh, so don't make it too big and don't make it too small. What you can also have is voids. These are no data pixels. And they need to be removed, otherwise you cannot uh, do the rest of the procedure. 
And there's a, a core tool. Uh, the GDAL tools are uh, still, of course, core, and it will remain uh, like that. The fill no data tool. There are other fill no data tools that do completely different things. So you really need this fill no data tool. And what it does, if you look at the picture, it will look at the surrounding elevation values, and it will interpolate that. And then you have a raster without voids. A bigger problem is uh, sinks. These are artificial depressions in your DEM. And um, here you see it. The water can get trapped into the pixels with a lower value while it needs to flow to your outlet. And this has to do with the acquisition of DEM. So they always have that problem. And you need to run this fill sinks algorithm to remove these artificial depressions. But it will also remove your non-artificial depressions. So if that's important in your study area, you need to still burn it into your uh, DEM after applying this fill sinks function. How does it work visually? So we have here in the, with the arrow, you see the flow direction, and we look to the side, the profile of elevation, and we see that the water gets, uh, um, gets stuck. Let's see if this works. Oh, I, here. Water gets stuck here, stuck here and doesn't flow to the outlet, which is further. So there are different ways to deal with it, either increase the level or carve that the water will uh, flow out. Um, this is a calculation intensive step, it needs to be done iteratively and there are many algorithms for that. We'll look at that later. But the flow direction, uh, that is what you need to calculate that. And you can, of course, use a raster with directions in degrees and then we have zero to 360 degrees. Uh, zero and 360 are north and uh, all the numbers, they're readable there. We can do that. The problem is that uh, you need more than eight bits to store it. And with eight bits, we can store two to the power of eight is 256 uh, values. Computers store them from zero to 255. And therefore, uh, they came up with that we don't need all these values. There are just eight discrete directions that we uh, can use. Um, and that's the D8 algorithm. So if you remember that uh, moving window that calculated the... Uh, the slopes to all the directions, that's just in eight directions and not in all the 360 degrees. So the problem there is that different tools use different encodings. And um, that encoding, that's called a flow direction raster or the D8 flow pointer raster. You can see both in software. And here you see examples of different software, commercial and open source, and they all use different encodings. So if you want to mix tools, it's very important that you take care of uh, which encoding your flow direction of your previous step is using when you feed it into a next algorithm from another tool which expects a certain encoding. Yeah, so PC Raster, for example, uses the encoding which is similar to the keys on your uh, numeric pad on your keyboard which has those arrows. So be aware of that and then there's also um, the different algorithms that you can use. So the most simple one and most used one is D8, where you have these eight discrete directions, but there can also be the D infinity, uh, D infinity algorithm, and that um, uh, uses uh, more uh, neighboring uh, cells, and uh, it's good for handling ambiguous topography, and it uh, minimizes the overdispersion. Then we have single flow direction and multiple flow direction, and uh, they are also more advanced ways of doing that. Um, but I, my advice would be here, uh, always start with the D8 and uh, see if that already gives good results. In science, we normally choose for the most simple solution. And more difficult cases when, are when your landscapes are very flat, uh, then things become more difficult and you might want to play with different algorithms that are mentioned here to see if the result improves. So those were the algorithms, but then which uh, tools do you use then for calculating the flow direction? And what I found was that white box tools has the most options and, uh, uh, and has uh, for flow direction calculations, but also for your different pointer rasters. And you can see here for D8, D infinity, uh, the examples. And, uh, but as I said, if the workflow uses different processing provider tools, so if you want to mix uh, grass with white box, you need to take care of that you reclassify the flow direction to the right uh, pointer grid that is needed, otherwise your answers will be wrong. And then the fill sinks algorithms uh, from Saga and Whitebox tools. There is uh, Planchon and Darbu and Wang and Yu available that you, uh, you can find. 
Uh, PC Raster uses a very specific one which has a bit more flexibility. Um, you can have uh, five parameters controlling the core area and the core volume. Uh, so how much you want to fill the depressions, it can be useful if you don't want to fill all the depressions. Um, and with LDD create, you will create the flow direction, but if you want, want to correct the DEM, you need to use LDD create DEM. But normally, it does it, you need it just in one step, filling the uh, sinks and then using the flow direction for the next step that comes out of LDD create. And then um, GRASS uh, uses the Jensen and uh, Domingue uh, algorithm with the R fill there tool that is available. If you have a river network available, you can uh, burn it into the stream network, also for your other depressions to force the water to follow that. That's an optional step. You can also do this whole procedure by deriving the stream network from uh, the algorithms. For burning, there are some tools. Uh, there's from white box tools, the fill burn tool. For grass, there's R carve. And I have some videos on my YouTube channel if you want to know more about that. Uh, but generally, these are complicated procedures, cause a lot of uh, errors. So uh, always be very careful and test well uh, what works in your area. So then we have the flow direction for each pixel. When we connect all these flow directions, we can get the, the stream link. But all these linked pixels are not your rivers. Some pixels are rivers. Some are just where the, the rivers are not even starting, but uh, water starts uh, collecting. So you need to calibrate that with uh, a reference map. You can use OpenStreetMap or a satellite image. And then you have two choices. You can use Strahler orders, or you can uh, use flow accumulation. Both methods are very uh, similar. They both need calibration. So let's first have a look at Strahler order. There are also other ordering uh, tools available from Whitebox, for example. From PC Raster, we use stream order. And Strahler starts with giving the smaller stream value one. When two of the same order join, it increases, so it becomes two. If two of two join, it becomes three. But if a smaller order joins a higher order, it will just stay with that higher order, etc. And then the user need to determine, do I consider every stream, every tributary larger than three as a river? And you calibrate that with, uh, with a map. Um, flow accumulation uh, works differently. I find Strahler order more intuitive, but with uh, flow accumulation, it's a more continuous approach. So we uh, accumulate the water over the network. We assume every cell uh, has uh, one unit, and it uses the flow direction to accumulate then the water over uh, the flow direction. And then you will end up with a map like that. And then you need to determine uh, what is the minimum accumulation that I consider as a river, and then you can de uh, delineate your river from uh, the raster. We can uh, then define the outflow point of our catchment on the delineated stream. And this can be uh, where it really gets into a larger river or into a lake or the ocean, but it can also be where you have your uh, discharge measuring device, your gauging. Uh, but you need to snap it to the delineated stream because you're creating a model. So if you put a point really where you see it on OpenStreetMap, uh, big chance that it will not work. So these are uh, tools uh, that you can use. Um, with PIT, you get all the outlets automatically, which are uh, just the depressions that it finds, local depressions. Um, there are some snapping tools in uh, white box tools. Uh, there's the catchment and subcatchment tool that you can use with PC Raster. And um, there are some scripts that are provided, user-based uh, scripts. And Grass also has uh, nice tools that you can use. You can automate these things because processing provider tools can be connected in a graphical model to automate your process. And uh, this is a tool that even only needs your study area and the point to which you want to uh, route the water, and then it will do the rest automatically. But it's still important as a specialist to know what's behind because it will not always work as you want. Uh, with the PC Raster Tools plugin, you can add more tools and models. Um, there's a repository, and you can add it there and find more tools with the uh, QGIS resource sharing plugin. Then there's some nice tools for visualizing the flow direction. Um, this uses crayfish, and we can then have arrows plotted on your raster which show the flow direction. It uses the mesh styling functionality of uh, QGIS. So there you also see how things nicely integrate and at these kind of events we cooperate with people who make this and see if we can make it happening. I still have two slides left. Um, one of the newest things uh, in the newest version uh, uh, of QGIS 
uh, it's possible to animate uh, rasters. So if you have rasters in a stack, each band can be assigned uh, a start and an end uh, time, and you can use the temporal controller to animate your uh, results of a runoff model for PC raster, for example. It accepts virtual rasters and uh, NetCDF. If you want to know more about this, uh, so Kurt and I, as already mentioned, uh, have written the book QGIS for hydrological applications. Uh, the first edition uses Saga, the second edition uh, PC Ruster, I recommend the second edition. And by purchasing the book, you support uh, students from the global south to join uh, FOS4G and uh, QGIS events. Unfortunately, visa of the one I was supporting for this event, uh, still waiting for the visa. And for the QGIS uh, user conference, we have uh, uh, we have a student from IG Delft from uh, Sudan who will join, Razan El Noor. So I hope you'll meet her there. And that was my presentation. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Hans. Well, and well in time. Other questions? Um, Thank you very much. I am Sultan from Saudi Arabia. The one we saw is a uh, topographic uh, watershed. What about uh, ancient uh, watershed under the sand? Did you use uh, other like radar or you use a uh, raster radar or other? I'm data? not specialized in that, unfortunately. And uh, so the algorithms I presented really need uh, gravity. It's about surface runoff. It doesn't take into account uh, groundwater. Uh, it will not work in the Netherlands, where we invert the landscape. We pump up all the water in the rivers that are above us and not in a valley. <laughs> so for your specific question, that needs a study. And uh, then we need to find what works best. Uh, we had uh, some years ago, occurred to me, uh, a student in the, or a participant of a short course and wanted to apply this to a desert uh, river. But we could s clearly see that all the uh, streams there were lower than the, uh, than the level of the landscape. So then you would just use map alg algebra and say everything lower than some value is the river. So it's not always the best solution to go through the whole workflow if you have different conditions. Yeah, uh, for example, we are, uh, uh, because uh, we have a desert and we have full of sun, and we have raining, you know, uh, in the winter. Mm -hmm. So what we did uh, to uh, observe uh, watershed, we come to uh, when the rainy season, and then there is many moisture content in the watershed, either big or small, and then we just subtract, you know, one year, uh, with, and then a lot of you know, information you comes. Do. But uh, one point is uh, when it is go under the uh, big sand dune, you know, so also this is other topic maybe. Yeah, you need uh, unsaturated zones and ground, uh, groundwater Thank specialists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? You have now the chance. Yeah, sir? So it's just a question about your T-shirt. Is it the catchments of Europe? Because it's very impressive. <laughs> Yeah, it's catchments of Europe, not uh, delineated by this procedure, but you could do that. But this comes from uh, Hydro Sheds, and you can buy it in my web shop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, thanks. Nice, okay. Um, then another uh, round of applause for Hans.